brown bread, a slice of cheese, some tomato, and a crisp lettuce leaf. I don't suppose there are many people who make their own sandwiches for a day out these days, but I thought it best to be prepared because I'm not quite sure what to expect. Well, I'm off to Pulau Ubin. I've not been to that delightful island for simply years. I'm reliably informed that much has changed, but not too much, I hope. It's a bit of a magical mystery tour, but one that I'm very much looking forward to. Eight thirty a.m. at the Changi Ferry Terminal, and Julian's not the only one making an early start. Pulau Ubin's a popular destination, and that's because there's nothing left in the entire of Singapore quite like it. But someone soon's going to think it a great idea to scrap these weathered little wooden boats and replace them with aircon aluminium and plastic numbers. So best you get out here and enjoy the experience while you still can. The scene at Changi is still much the same as it was 50 years ago, and perhaps that's what people like best. The opportunity to take a breezy and bouncy boat ride back into the past, just like our man with the hat. might only be a 15 minute trip, but it's pure pleasure. Pulau Ubin's looking good. Not a single high rise in sight. I've only taken a few steps ashore, and already it's very exciting. There's something special about a boat journey, even across a narrow strait like from here to Changi Jetty. And then there's the hustle and bustle of arrival and the boats coming and going. And most of all, there's that special smell. A combination of marine diesel, mangrove mud and prawn paste. A whiff of nostalgia. And then looking across the coast there, just reminds me of the East Coast when I was a child. The soughing of the wind through the coconut palms and the waves rolling over the rocks. It was really like that back in those days. Well, this is it. Only 10 square kilometers of land area admittedly, but with a density of flora and fauna you won't find anywhere else in Singapore. And Julian's just about here, in Ubin village. Now, I know it's a very overworked cliche, but going to pull out Ubin really is like stepping back in time. 25 to 30 years ago, much, if not most of Singapore, still looked like this. There was the city and downtown areas, and then there was the countryside with every so often a kampong or small rural town just like this, with its provision shops, temple, wayang stage, and kopi tea. Pulau Batu Ubin was the island's original Malay name, which loosely translates as Granite Stone Island. The granite quarries here had been the main source of livelihood for the islanders from 1848 up until when the last one closed down in 1999. However, what's equally interesting is the fact that Julian appears to be paying a visit to a small brick structure being slowly consumed by a large tree. Now I'm reliably informed that this is a French bread making oven, which seems pretty incredible. I mean, who on earth would want to be making baguettes out on Pulau Ubin? Perhaps it was a secret experiment by Deli France. Possibly so. And we're reliably informed that the French bread oven also had a more recent function, which was to store explosives used in Pulau Ubin's granite quarries. 
Just 50 meters behind it, history and horticulture combine in an attractive garden of economically useful plants. There's many of the expected local varieties and a few rather unexpected ones as well. Now this is interesting, Pisang and Kaladi. People have been eating bananas and yams for literally hundreds of thousands of years before prehistoric man discovered rice cultivation. Oh, and now I seem to have emerged into a, a grove of pandan. Now the pandan is obviously very popular in Malay and Nonya cuisine. You'll all be familiar with those round cakes of sticky rice, puluk pangang, wrapped in pandan leaves which are liberally dished out every hurry raya. The garden's full of plants that tend to give one a bit of an appetite. So it's hardly surprising to find what our man's decided to do next, is it? I've been feeling a bit peckish, so while you take a break, I think I'll take one too. And in a sandwich or three, I'll be back. Today, a lot of Japanese tourists visit Pulau Ubin, but there was a time when their countrymen were rather less than welcome. On the evening of February the 7th, 1942, the crack Kono Imperial Guard came ashore on the north side of Pulau Ubin. But this was just a diversionary tactic to draw attention away from the main invasion beachhead, which was just a few miles down the coast in the region of Kranji. That, however, came a day later. So what's interesting here is that Pulau Ubin was actually the first part of Singapore territory to be occupied by the Japanese. Julian's heading out of town now for a long trek around the island. However, if you're planning a visit here, we should point out that there's hundreds of bicycles available for hire, which you might find more preferable. A quick look at our map locates our man just about here, not far from Ubin village, and as usual, he's found a place he'd like to investigate more fully. <laughs> Now, I've come to visit the home of the head man of Pulau Ubin, the Pengulu. Now, he's, he's a rather elderly gentleman in his 98th year, so he's taking an afternoon nap. His family have uh, very kindly allowed us to walk around the outside of the house. And I have to say, again, it's something straight out of the past. I can hardly, I can hardly believe that some, something like this still exists. Beautiful old, typical rural farmhouse from, say, the middle of the last century and it's surrounded by fruit trees and all sorts of interesting life forms. There's some uh, terrapins in there. And here we are under a mango tree. That's some chickens over here. Beautiful uh, looking specimen, jungle fowl. And this one in here, if I'm not mistaken, is a Japanese cockerel. I'm a bit of a chicken fancier myself. So let's progress around the side here. There's forms of uh, bird, minor birds. I don't know what he is. I've, I've uh, brought actually for the day, I brought uh, Dr. Tweedy's Common Birds of the Malay Peninsula. Excellent book. I've had one ever since I was about four years old. Now this is something I can hardly credit, but in the middle of Pulau Ubin, I should come across an ostrich. I don't think I'm going to find him in Dr. Tweedy's tome. In fact, I don't think he's endemic to the continent of Asia. I haven't been that close to an ostrich before. Quite fabulous. I bet he pecks a bit, mate. Anyway, let's keep on our way. Um, right, so here we are at the back of the uh, house. Well, all the uh, accoutrements of the old country way of life. Vegetable garden at the back here. Here we have a wood-burning stove, an enormous wok on top, the old hob for boiled water. Mm. The headman's house is probably the largest left on the island, and may indeed always have been the largest. Being a headman does come with certain privileges after all. There are other houses nearby which are more modest structures, but certainly colourful ones. Now this has to be the mother of all durian trees. I've never seen one quite so large in all my life. Amazing. <laughs> 
Julian's heading east and he's got a specific objective in mind. It's round about here on our map, right on the coast. However, there appears to be a problem. A large and locked gate blocking the road. Well, I had wanted to show you a rather interesting place at the eastern end of the island, but it seems that for the time being at least, the place is temporarily out of bounds. However, all is not lost. Now, at the beginning of the program, I said that I hadn't been to Pulau Ubin for years. Well, that wasn't exactly accurate. Now, you may recall my friend Captain Warren and his schooner, the Four Friends, from a couple of episodes back. But we were sailing a few months ago, and he suggested that we should put into Pulau Ubin for a brief landfall to check out some rather curious relics from the days of the British. This is precisely what we did one sunny afternoon. Now this extraordinary place is, is one of my favourite sites in the whole of Singapore. I can remember coming here many, many years ago. It must have been in the mid-60s when I was a boy. And of course, it wasn't a ruin in those days. And we came for tea. A friend brought us over on a, on a launch, which landed at the jetty over there. And we walked up, it was a lovely lawn. And then there was this marvelous Mok Tudor uh, villa on Pulau Ubin. It's such a strange idea. Obviously built by some nostalgic Englishman pining for the home counties of England. And it's really quite well done with all the brick infill and the half timbered framework. And there's this fabulous sea breeze and some uh, Norfolk Island pines there just to remind them of good old Blighty. It's a lovely place. I wonder what will happen to it next. You may recall the line from that famous poem by Rupert Brooke, a corner of a foreign field that is forever England. Well, I reckon that old house is precisely that. Best we first look at our map before we catch up with Julian, and his travels have taken him to just about here. Kampong Melayu was once a thriving community with 300 residents. Nowadays, though the houses are still here, there are only eight former residents. But let's take a look inside this house, see what we can find. Wow, uh, pretty sorry state. All is corruption and decay. Anyhow, we can still get a pretty good idea of how things must have been originally. I, I seem to have come in through the, the back door. This would have been the, the cooking area, the dapo, and the washing facilities over there, the tempat mandi. And then the main part of the house, raised up on posts, tiang, a wooden floor, much better for ventilation. And I have to say, it's quite cool, certainly today. And this would have been, as I say, the main living space in the house with a little billet for sleeping in. Cross ventilation with the windows. And then out here would have been the main entrance porch or anjo. Probably quite a nice place to sit out of an evening. Some nice hibiscus uh, bushes there. Yeah, well, yeah, it's not going to survive much longer. The roof ridge will collapse and then the whole edifice will slowly subside into the ground. And in 10 years from now, it'll probably just be the concrete base. Must have been nice once upon a time there. Eh? Oh, well, this looks a bit more like it, a bit more cheerful. And in fact, one gets a good idea of the general layout from the outside here, with the entrance porch at one end, and then the main part of the house, the Ruba Ibu, and then at the back here, the Dapur and uh, washing facilities. I'd say the house was probably built in the 1960s, and it's probably one of the last examples of the more or less traditional Malay house. Seems to be deserted though, currently the property of a couple of cats. The 
Back in the 50s, there were some 3,000 people living on Pulau Ubin, but today I believe there are less than 80 people left on the island, which is a rather sad statistic. Since the quarries had been the islanders' main source of employment, as they closed down, the population dwindled. More recently, however, coastal swamps have been reclaimed and put to use by other, less labour-intensive industries. And here we are at one of them. Now this is the Ad Power Venture Prawn Farm, belonging to a Mr. Punk. And these ponds here were excavated from a mangrove swamp using a mechanical digger filled with water, and this is where they grow prawns. There are two ways to harvest prawns. Either you swoop through these ponds with a net, or else you drain them and let them dry out in the mud. Now, I didn't come out here out of idle curiosity, because what I had in mind was a modest purchase for my supper. Hello, Mr. Punk. Now, you are very well known for your most delicious uh, Fresh prawns? Yes. Do we you have, have any for me today? Yes, we have. Yes. All inside the box, ready for you. Oh, how wonderful. Now, what are they? Tigers, are yes, they? Yes, the black tiger. Well, I have to say, they look jolly delicious. OK, I'll certainly have okay. some of those. Um, 500 grams? No, make it, make it a kilo. Okay? Make it a kilo better. All right, okay. OK, fantastic. Well, I've got my prawns, and I've got a pretty good idea what I'm going to do to them when I get back home. Yum, yum. <laughs> A couple of hundred metres from the prawn farm is one of the island's vast granite quarries, now filled with water and reputedly as deep as two 12-storey HDB blocks. Well, it's a beautiful spot, but it actually reminds me of uh, quite a dark story which goes back to the time of the First World War when Britain and Germany were fighting it out in Europe. Now in those days there was a plantation here on Blauben and it belonged to a German family. And of course being Germans and Britain being at war with Germany they had to be rounded up and interned for the duration. And the daughter of the family, hearing that the, the British authorities were coming to round up her father and mother and herself, ran away. And it was night time and by mischance she fell into one of these quarries on Plauben and drowned. The Malay people found her body floating in the water and they brought it to the shore and they buried her in a sort of temporary grave. But subsequently, um, her body was exhumed and her bones were brought to a Chinese temple. When the Chinese workers dug up her mortal remains, they placed them in a casket or an urn and they buried them in a grave near this site. And there they remained for a good number of years, but in the mid-70s, extension to the quarry works meant that they had to be exhumed, and they were placed in this shrine, which was built especially for them. And as far as I'm aware, they are meant to be in this particular casket that you see here. And what's interesting about this altar is that you see all these accoutrements, which one might associate with a young girl. Cosmetics, nail varnish, a comb, some... Uh, powder for the face, it's all rather poignant. Now over the years the German girl became associated with good fortune, as in a gambler's lucky streak. And gamblers used to come over from the mainland and pray here in order to get good luck for toto, horse racing or whatever it was. Which is a bit surprising considering she didn't have much good fortune in her young life. Now there's a bit of a twist actually because it has been said that when the casket was being moved from the grave to this temple, Someone actually took the top off and had a look inside, and believe it or not, there was nothing there. But I'm not about to try myself. The quarry that once lay close beside the temple has now been filled in as part of the redevelopment of the island. And one hopes that a similar plan isn't being considered for the quarry we just visited. Rare and rather spectacular sight. The Pulau Ubin of yesteryear has been the inspiration for countless artists, not the least amongst them, watercolour painter and cultural medallion winner Ong Kim Seng. 
His paintings recapture the tranquil mood and beauty of island life far more effectively than any photograph could. An historical as well as an artistic record of bygone days. Our man with the hats by now made his way back into Ubin village, so we'd better join him as well. Well, it's been a long but extremely agreeable day out here on Pulau Ubin. However, I guess it's about time I thought of making my way home. But there's one last thing I must do before I head on down to the jetty to find a boat to take me across the mainland, and that's pop in here. Now, I happen to notice in passing that this shop sells my hat. And this one is clearly getting to the end of its life, so what better opportunity than to purchase a new one? Hello, uh, I want to buy a hat, please. A topi, yeah? Ah, oh, perfect. That's very really good. Ah, oh, the exact fit. Okay, how much? While Julian parts with $2 for high fashion headwear, let's take a look right. not into okay, the past, but okay, into bye -bye. the future. Fantastic. Expect a very different episode of Sight and Sound to conclude our current series. Dawns and Departures takes a thoughtful look at the 20 years leading up to the birth of a nation, and we're going to hear all about it from people who are actually there at the time. Memories, opinions and reflections from half a century ago, as well as a celebration of Singapore's 39th birthday. This season of Sight and Sound's going out with a bang, so don't miss it. And Julian's purchase from the prawn farm, I've got to say, is looking pretty tasty. Although the Pulau Ubin that I remember is not the Pulau Ubin of today, it's still a very green and pleasant place to visit. Moreover, it's just about the only part of Singapore where one can get some impression of what the island used to be like before the big move to the HDB estates some 20 to 30 years ago. And that's important, I think. Pulau Ubin should be kept just the way it is, as a reminder of how Singapore used to be until such a short time ago. Imagine if, as a tourist, one were to visit England and there were no villagers or cows in fields, country lanes or pubs, and all the other things one associates with England as one reads about it in books or sees in the cinema. Now that would be a pretty disappointing thing. So I strongly feel that Pulau Ubin should be preserved as a kind of rural heritage site, a reminder of Singapore's Kampong past. Now that would be a fine thing, and I'll drink to that. Well, I've been feeling a bit peckish, and uh, I can't remember what I'm going to say next. Uh, rural heritage site. Sorry, <laughs> this bloody cat that left that behind. <laughs> Sorry about that. You may recall the famous lines of front me. You may recall the line of... Uh, sorry, wait, 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 Raj. Uh, and people would come over from the main line. <laughs> sorry, main line. Okay, sorry, can we take that from the top? Okay. okay.